good afternoon uh, from AIT Thailand, everyone. And uh, this is uh, a program online sessions that we are producing from uh, Studio Extensions. And as you know, uh, my name is Warawe Cholasin. I'm working at the AIT Extension of the Asian Institute of Technologies. Uh, we are having these uh, online sessions uh, almost uh, three times a month uh, or sometimes twice a month uh, in order to uh, provide the audience with uh, some of the current and up-to-date uh, knowledges uh, so that our audience can be you know, aware about the subjects and also knowledge that we are talking about today. Uh, we have a wide range of the topics um, every month that we try to add on into the program so that the audience uh, from the companies and public agencies can also benefit uh, from our program uh, continuously. We are also going to have, you know, different other program on the second half of the year. And I hope that uh, not only today that you are following us, uh, you know, uh, you can also follow us up, you know, uh, in other programs as well. So uh, for today's program, uh, I'm very much uh, excited uh, because the subject matters that we are going to share with the audience today is always, you know, uh, up to date and also always something that we have to catch up because one of the uh, natural disaster, which is an earthquake, is something that the human being, the humankind and mankind have to really keep our eyes on that. The donor agencies, the government agencies and also INGO are also keeping eyes on that and trying to develop a lot of uh, policies and tools and solutions in order to be able to uh, make uh, uh, early warning uh, taking place and also to do a kind of a disaster response uh, on time enough so that we can reduce the impact to the human being and also at the same time engineers and scientists and managers and owner of the businesses also trying to see how the how the you know structures and buildings in on the top of the soil can be also safe and also reduce the calamities from the earthquake so uh, today we have a very interesting topics uh, that uh, as i said and we are going to have the sessions on the subjects that related to the performance-based seismic structural health monitoring of the tall building. And we are very pleased to organize this program with AIT Solution. AIT Solution is one of the uh, engineering and scientific solution hub at Asian University of Technologies. Uh, we have the team of engineers, we have the team of uh, scientists, we have the teams of the expert and practitioners to find out solution in various areas that related to the uh, technologies and AI and buildings and structures and civil engineering and so on and so forth. So I would like uh, to uh, invite uh, Mr. Ong, the director of AI2 Solutions to give the opening remarks for this online session. Mr. Ong, please. Thank you, Convora Wait, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, uh, please uh, allow me to uh, briefly talk about uh, AID Solutions. AID Solutions is one of the outreach centers in AID as uh, introduced by Convera with uh, like uh, AID Extension. We connect the institute with industry by providing the solutions in the areas of structural engineering and uh, software development. Related to structural engineering, we provide the services in performance-based seismic evaluation, structural design review, wind tunnel testing, and uh, structural health monitoring. Normally, structural engineers uh, design the buildings to resist the earthquakes if the building is located in the seismic environment. We design the building by following the building code provisions and requirements. In the code-based design approaches, uh, engineers do not actually evaluate the ability of the structure to perform as intended by the code. Rather, engineer uh, is able to presume that uh, because the building complies uh, with the prescriptive requirements of the code, the performance will be achieved. In performance-based seismic design, we carry out the detailed analysis and simulations of the structure for different levels of earthquakes. 
This approach, this performance-based approach will guarantee the safer buildings and better reliability with the cost effectiveness by explicit evaluation of the uh, structural performance. After design and construction of the buildings and infrastructure, we still need to monitor and inspect the structural systems during their service life. These days, people uh, monitor their buildings for the energy efficiency and other uh, different engineering aspects. In today's talk, uh, we would like to share our knowledge and experience in structural health monitoring of the tall buildings from a structural engineering point of view. I hope everyone will get this valuable uh, knowledge uh, from this informative talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ong. Uh, Mr. Ong himself is the structural engineer, and he is one of the experts in AIT on the performance-based uh, structural engineering monitoring and these things. Uh, but today, we, are, we will not be listening to Mr. Ong, but we are going to listening to one of the uh, experts in AIT, who is the uh, coordinator of the wind tunnels testing and structural health monitoring of AIT solutions, Mr. S.M. Siyudin. So without a further delay, I would like to request uh, Zia uh, to give the presentation and also, you know, share the knowledge on the performance-based seismic structural health monitoring of the tall buildings. Uh, Zia, please. All right. So without any delay, I'm just uh, going to start uh, without introduction and so on. Uh, actually, Mr. Ong already made some uh, introductions uh, on the topic. Uh, uh, actually, this topic is uh, performance-based seismic structural health monitoring of tall buildings. And uh, Mr. Ong already explained why, what is performance-based design, uh, which is like uh, going outside of the building code limitations and design the structure as per its per, uh, performance. So we can do it, also, uh, we can also implement it in structure health monitoring. So that is why we are calling it performance-based uh, seismic structure health monitoring. Now, one thing may not be clear that why we need to do uh, seismic structure health monitoring uh, whatsoever. Why we need to do it? Uh, is it like some sort of a way to make a problem which is not there? Or is it really a problem? All right. So uh, just one video clip uh, that will answer the question. Uh, it was captured during a uh, Great East, uh, Japan earthquake. Uh, in this video, uh, this video was captured from uh, uh, Shinjuku Center building. And in this video, you'll see Sue of uh, two of the structure. At the left, it, it is called uh, Shinjuku Namura building. And at the right, uh, Sompo Japan Nippon Kwa Insurance Building. All right. Now, uh, if you are an occupant or uh, if you are owner of this building, quite obvious that you will be terrified. And then you may decide to evacuate the building. But if it is structurally sound, in that case, uh, evacuation of a building uh, may give uh, some financial loss. All right. So uh, we basically have two problems. One is you are scared uh, to stay in the building. Maybe the building is still okay, but you don't know that. Another is there may be financial loss and maybe uh, uh, you, you don't want that as well. And it is not like only people in Japan, they get scared. Uh, it happened uh, in, in Thailand as well. Yeah, believe me, even, even though there is not too much of a seismic events in Thailand, but there was an earthquake uh, back in 2016 in Myanmar which is about 1,000 kilometers away from Bangkok. But still, uh, people in Bangkok, they were scared and they, they uh, left their house and offices. So they, they were scared. So that is uh, where uh, this uh, structure health monitoring come to place uh, to assure the performance of your structure. It can be in, in both direction. Maybe it is performing well, or maybe it is not, but it will assure what is the performance. and. Uh, it may reduce some financial loss uh, in terms of like if you are evacuating the building, if it, it still the building is okay. So uh, it will help uh, in that way. Now, how we can do uh, evaluation and what we have done, uh, that that what I'll explain. Uh, we can do it in three different ways uh, as far what we have done. Uh, one is numerical simulation. This one is the easiest way to do so. Uh, easiest way in a sense that nowadays there are many softwares which uh, where you can model the final element 
And then uh, if you somehow know the uh, uh, ground acceleration, you can apply to your planetary model. And from the analysis, you can get uh, all sorts of responses, uh, response of your uh, shear walls, columns, girders, link beams, and so on. All right, and uh, you can perform numbers of uh, response, uh, number of analysis scheme. Here I'm showing the analysis scheme, which is based on uh, nonlinear response history analysis. We can do response spectrum analysis as well, that I'll uh, also show uh, later on. So this is one of the approaches, which is quite uh, simple enough. And then uh, vibration measurement. What I'm showing here is force vibration. You can see some individuals are pushing, building from one direction, another direction, some individuals are pushing. They are actually trying to push the structure in its torsional mode. So uh, this is force vibration test. There are There is another easier option that is called ambient vibration test. Uh, from there, we can get some dynamic properties of the structure based on which we can evaluate uh, the performance of the structure. All right. And then uh, this is what I'll be focusing more today, uh, which is data deep uh, driven analysis scheme. All right, because we believe uh, this is going to be the future. If a building structure is instrumented in numbers of floors, maybe eight floors or 10 floors, in that case, we can get the floor acceleration data and we can use that one to uh, uh, estimate uh, various responses like story drift responses or maybe story shear force, overturning moments, and so on. Uh, that I'll be explaining in details. So these three approaches will be explained. And at first, I want to start with the easiest one, which is numerical simulation. All right. So this is a case uh, which is in in Philippines. Um, they have DPWH. DPWH uh, stands for Department of Public Wor uh, Works and Highways. Uh, they actually have a, a guideline that in Philippines, if you have a structure that is over 50 meters tall, in that case, you have to uh, install accelerometers in three floor levels. One would be at the ground floor or below. One would be somewhere at the mid height. These blinking dots are actually placement of the accelerometers. Okay. And what would be at the top floor? Now, this number of accelerometers is actually not enough for data-driven analysis scheme, but uh, we can do actually numerical simulation by using data. And the thing is, uh, the accelerometer that are placed, uh, which I have shown at the left uh, hand side of the screen, these accelerometers are quite expensive. Uh, this one uh, set cost around 5,000 USD. So in a building, uh, we have to install, even by the guideline, we have to install uh, by uh, 15,000 US dollars of uh, accelerometers itself. So that is why you cannot really place it in FD flow level because it is expensive. Now, how can we use it for the numerical simulation? Uh, okay, after an earthquake event, uh, we can get the acceleration uh, data from the ground floor or maybe in the, from the lower basement. And then when we get the acceleration and data at first, uh, which I have shown here, uh, at first we get the response spectrum, all right? Uh, this is actually required uh, to identify what type of analysis that will run. Uh, here, I, I compared the response spectrum that we have estimated with a uh, service level earthquake response spectrum. In service level earthquake, we uh, assume the response of the structure would be in elastic. Uh, so as we uh, assume the response of the structure would be elastic, so that's why we can uh, run a response spectrum analysis in this case. If our estimated uh, response spectrum was like higher than uh, service level earthquake, in that case, we have to run nonlinear response history analysis, all right? So uh, let's start uh, see some results from response spectrum analysis. At first, uh, we uh, check the joint acceleration response. So the spectrum that we obtained uh, from the ground acceleration of, of the instrumented uh, building, uh, we use that one for response, uh, uh, run the response spectrum analysis and we get joint acceleration along the height of the structure uh, from, uh, from our finite element model, okay? So these purple lines are showing actually numerical simulation outcomes. Here, this red dot and this green dots, these are actually 
the peak acceleration response coming from the sensor. So we try to compare our outcomes uh, from the with, with the sensor outcome, but uh, just to see like how uh, I mean how much of a match of our fine entanglement model can give in compare to the actual measurement measured uh, responses. In some cases, we can find very good match. Some cases maybe maybe not so much. And I'll explain why it can be a bit different. I mean, fine entanglement model response and actual building response can can actually be different as well. So at first, we actually check by joint acceleration response and we can estimate uh, global responses for example in this case we compared our estimated drift response historic drift response with thus a service level earthquake response which is in this blue line this green line is actually the response that we estimated from the ground acceleration that we obtained from a seismic event and then we also compared with a, a code limit okay uh, this is coming from let bsdc code for service level earthquake response all right and not only the global responses we can also uh, estimate local response by local response i mean response of the structural members in this case i'm showing shear wall shear response a uh, similar way we can estimate uh, shear wall uh, flagrant response we can estimate column response girder and link beam and so on all right, I just want to uh, show one, one, one response in this case. So in this way, we can actually identify uh, a structural uh, response of uh, each and every member and even the global responses. So this approach is quite, uh, in that way, a very easy method. But the thing is, it has some drawbacks that we also need to know. One thing is, a uh, fine entanglement model can be quite uh, different from the actual structure. Here, this green and this uh, red dots, these are actually nature pair that we obtain by uh, doing the ambient vibration test of a structure. And as you can see, uh, this uh, blue dot and this uh, pink dot is actually a nature pair of a fine element model. And uh, you can see the responses of, uh, from the fine element model can be quite different uh, from the actual measurement. And actually, uh, the code writers, they also don't, all right? If you see uh, ASC code 716 or uh, even the new, uh, newest updated one, uh, they give two different equations uh, to check uh, uh, the nature frequency of the structure. If it is real structure, it should be building height by 150. And if it is finite element model, then it should be building height over 100. So in that case, we can say our real structure and finite element model both can be right. Well, why this difference happens? Because uh, structural engineers, uh, we are a bit lazy or maybe we are just uh, occupied with too much of our workload, maybe. Uh, we do not tend to model uh, like partition walls and then uh, many other components we, we do not uh, model uh, like accurately. Actually, even if we model, the responses may be different because uh, in, uh, models are perfect. For example, if you make a concrete model, uh, whatever the capacity you provide, that will, in, in the model, it, it, it will remain same, right? Uh, but in the real structure, actually, uh, there is differential uh, stiffness along the height. It can, it can happen. So that is why fine treatment models and real structure can be slightly different. And this is about the nature period. And as I say, uh, about the differential stiffness for that reason our mode shapes can be quite different as well here in these two uh, figures i'm showing a uh, first mode nature uh, uh, mode shape and then this is second mode these green lines are actually the outcomes of our final treatment model ATAPS that we have used and then these red lines are outcomes uh, of our test ambient vibration test that i'll show from from the very next slide all right, uh, and, and as you can see, the mode shapes from fine treatment model and the real structure can be very different, way different, okay? Now, fine treatment models are sensitive to dynamic properties like nature periods and mode shapes. So outcomes, uh, in some cases, you, you may not be able to actually, uh, I mean, you cannot really believe on, on your results because if the dynamic properties are different, outcomes of, uh, the fine-tailment model uh, can be quite different as well, all right? 
So this is a drawback of this approach. And then, okay, how can uh, we can come up with a different solution that brings us to uh, vibration measurement level. Now, uh, previously I have shown a video that is of course vibration. And I, I mentioned that time then there is a zero way uh, which is called uh, ambient vibration measurement. For that, uh, you will be at least needing a three set of accelerometers that you can see here. All right, uh, so how can we use it? Okay. Now, out of three accelerometers, one, we use it as a reference station, uh, which is placed at the top of your structure, all right, uh, at the top floor. And then we use two other uh, sensor setups as uh, moving stations that we place in every, let's say, uh, two floor interval. So the total arrangement looks like this, okay? In the top floor, we have the reference station and the moving stations we, we measure in every two floor intervals for, let's say, around 15 minutes. So the reference station is not going to move. It is going to stay there for, let's say, entire day. And moving station, for a, in every two floor interval, will let's say measure for uh, 15 minutes, okay? From the measurement, we get some ambient vibration uh, acceleration. Uh, it actually doesn't give too much of information, uh, only the acceleration itself. But if we do uh, some analysis, for example, if we do it uh, first Fourier transformation, from there, we should be able to get the nature frequency of the structure for first mode, uh, uh, translation in X, first mode in Y, we can get the torsional nature frequency. And uh, we have tested number of structures and this uh, plot shows that uh, here every red dot is uh, one structure that we have tested, okay? And we can, uh, these are the nature period that we have obtained. And then we compared our outcomes with two different equations again. Uh, the, this black line is actually uh, one of the equations that is commonly used, uh, which is height in feet by 150. And so we uh, find out that uh, our uh, nature period that we have obtained from the buildings, which have flat slab system, actually gives quite uh, accurate response as per this uh, equation. But when we our building have moment frame system, in that case, it becomes uh, stiffer. And even the, in the building codes, they provide an equation, which is building height over 220, which is applicable for buildings in Japan, okay? Because those buildings are a bit uh, steeper. So for that, the equation is just the building height and fit by 220. So that matches well with the uh, moment frame system building. Now with this measurement, we do not only get the nature period, uh, we can also get more shapes. Okay, first translational mode in X, Y, and also torsional mode shapes. And I have shown earlier already that uh, these mode shapes we can compare with our finite element model outcome. And in most of the cases, you can find uh, discrepancy because uh, in finite element model, we cannot capture uh, many of the things. Uh, so that is why nature period and mode shapes from finite element model and, and from the real structure can be a bit different. And aside from mode shapes, we can also obtain uh, damping. Now the question is, how can we use this information uh, for post earthquake response assessment? Well, that is the problem of this approach, all right? Okay, now here, this gray line is showing a nature period of a structure that we have measured in uh, somewhere in November, 2018, okay? And then, uh, there was an earthquake, uh, which was in 22nd April, uh, 2019. It's called Luzon earthquake, uh, which had a magnitude of 6.1. And it was around uh, 90 kilometers away from, from this uh, particular building site. And then we find out that uh, when we measured the same structure after that quick event uh, back uh, in uh, April, 2019, the nature period for all the modes actually have increased. Uh, not too much, but it have increased. Now, what does it mean? It means uh, the structure actually have lost uh, some uh, stiffness, okay? So, okay, first thing first, how we do the uh, post earthquake response assessment? It means uh, before earthquake, we have to measure a structure to have the benchmark. And after the earthquake event, we have to measure the same structure again. 
and then from the difference of the nature period and uh, if there is any change in the mode shape from there we can identify if the structure has some damage so you have to go to the site twice that is one drawback of this approach another is uh, how how do we understand uh, the responses the results itself uh, actually for structural engineers who are not into the structural dynamics it will be quite hard for them to understand that with the change of nature period, it basically means there are some steepness loss in your structure. And another problem is you cannot identify where is the damage or which member got uh, overstressed. Uh, so that is one of the drawbacks, uh, actually one of many drawbacks of, of these approaches. So we believe uh, over time, this uh, vibration measurement approach, it may get a uh, obsolete because like very hard to identify the problem itself so what would be the future now we'll uh, check on that and our belief is the future will be in the data-driven analysis scheme now this scheme actually have uh, one uh, very big problem is uh, this one is demanding demanding in a sense that now you cannot have a structure with a instrumented floor of only three floors because with only three floor instrumented, uh, you cannot really perform the data-driven analysis scheme. If a structure is instrumented in 10 floors or 11 floors, uh, this approach will uh, work uh, quite well that we have verified. I'll, I'll show how, how we have verified and what is our future plan as well. Uh, but what does it mean? It means a building owner have to spend $50,000 on a building for the instrumentation? Not really. Because uh, now, uh, nowadays, uh, we have MIM-based uh, accelerometer. This one actually cost uh, ar around $500, all right? So the accelerometer that I have shown previously, that one was $5,000. So that means uh, with the expense of only one, now you can purchase 10 of these accelerometers. And if you use 10 of these accelerometers, we can easily use the data-driven analysis scheme. And it is also saving you uh, $10,000 itself. By the way, I'm not a representative of this accelerometer anyway. I'm just uh, trying to show that it can be useful. That's, that's the main point here. All right. Now, uh, actually, even uh, billing owners, they need to come step forward because uh, more often, when I discussed with, with uh, our, our clients, and if I introduce this one, and what they say is like, okay, uh, by government regulation, we have to instrument a building uh, in only <laughs> three floor levels. So, okay, you give us a very cheap option. Uh, thank you so much, but we'll uh, just instrument it in, in, in only three floor levels. Well, in that case, uh, it will remain uncertain on whether... Uh, the response of the structure that we can get from uh, uh, numerical simulation that may be correct that uh, may not be uh, accurate enough you, you have to uh, stay in uncertainty anyway uh, but if you come forward then okay uh, this data driven uh, analysis scheme can be the future because uh, of very uh, cheaper accelerometers as as these accelerometers are a bit cheaper uh, that is why uh, we need to uh, check it first. So we have a, a structure lab over there. Uh, we have shake table. So we actually check the performance of this accelerometer. This one is a force balance accelerometer that we have used as a reference. And then we check the main base uh, accelerometers. Uh, here, I think you can see ab about 18 of the accelerometers are uh, tested. And then anyway, uh, we find out that these accelerometers may not be good enough for ambient vibration measurement, but for seismic performance evaluation with high amplitude acceleration, these accelerometers uh, can be used. All right. Now uh, let's go into the details how we can perform data driven analysis scheme. Uh, as the name says, uh, data driven analysis, it, it sounds a bit scary, but okay, there are some equations which may look a bit scary, but I can explain. Uh, if I explain, then you may find it quite fun, uh, I believe. Okay. Now, if our structure is instrumented in about 10 floor levels, 
So it, it means we can get nine floor levels acceleration, we can get the ground acceleration, and then from the finite element model of the structure, we can estimate the mode shape. If we do, in that case, just by solution of this equation, we should be able to estimate modal acceleration. This is the step one. And then it is just a two step process. Okay. Now, if you know the modal acceleration, which is estimated from the step one, uh, then we can get the use the finite element model to get the more shapes of the non-instrumented floats. We know the ground acceleration. So just by solution of this equation, we can easily estimate uh, acceleration response of the non-instrumented floats. Why we need it? Okay, we have an instrument, the structure in every floor level with this instrumented in 10 floors. What I'm saying, if we instrument in only 10 floors, the floors which we haven't instrumented, we can accurately estimate the acceleration response of those floors just by solution of these two equations. So even though it looks a bit uh, complicated maybe, but it really helps because it saves you a lot of money, right? Uh, you do not have to instrument every flow level. So, okay, what we do with the acceleration responses? Uh, if we just uh, double integrate the acceleration response, we can get the displacement time history. Okay, uh, so this one uh, in this plot, the red line, which actually is, uh, you cannot see because of the yellow dash line. Okay, red line is the response from nonlinear response history analysis. So at first we verify our approach with nonlinear response history analysis. Okay, and then, then this uh, yellow dash line, uh, which is overlapping this red line is uh, the, estimated response from our approach and by three modes by uh, what I mean is uh, we have instrumented uh, we assume that we have instrumented the structure in only four floor levels so that means if a structure is instrumented in only four uh, for uh, floor levels in that case we can accurately estimate displacement response along the height of the structure you do not need to instrument every floor level okay and beside the uh, flow displacement response is the interstory drift uh, envelope response. And what we found, if a symmetric shaped structure, in that case, if it is instrumented in only seven flow levels, we can accurately estimate uh, interstory drift response. Even the structure response is in, in elastic range. Okay, If it is elastic, it performs well, even in elastic, it also performs very well. And this interstory drift response actually commonly used by the industry. In this case, I'm showing a case for uh, Mori Building Corporation, where they have instrumented accelerometers in few floor levels. Then they estimate the, uh, uh, they perform uh, a structure evaluation using story drift responses. Uh, by comparing with uh, predefined thresholds, uh, small it means like uh, uh, immediate occupancy, moderate means uh, life safety, and severe means like uh, in the collapse pre uh, prevention performance level. Okay, so these predefined thresholds can be uh, estimated before an earthquake event from your finite element model at the very uh, early stage of the design procedure. So after an earthquake. Uh, you can estimate the storage drift response and you can compare the results with the predefined threshold to identify if there is any damage to your structure. But again, uh, this type of a response is quite complicated for structural engineers because we understand even more complicated response better. Uh, for example, uh, storage share response, overturning moment response, this we understand better. So that is why in AIT, we moved one step ahead. And then uh, we were able to estimate uh, story share responses, this figure, and then uh, overturning moment response as well. So these red lines are outcomes of nonlinear response history analysis. And then yellow tests are the outcomes uh, by, by the approach that we have proposed. Eight mode means if you have a structure instrumented in only nine floor levels, only nine floor out of uh, 40, let's say. In that case, uh, you can uh, 
solve this equation where most of the parameters you will obtain from the instrumented uh, data itself. And then uh, you should be able to estimate a uh, story share for response quite accurately. This is uh, within 10% of uh, error, okay? And as well as we can estimate overturning moment responses, all right? Uh, so quite obviously, uh, this would be the last outcome um, of uh, if I was from maybe another institute, but okay, as we see, uh, we take uh, one step ahead in, in AIT. Uh, so in this case, we also did so. And reason for that is uh, this. Vibration control devices, such as dampers. Uh, in some buildings in high seismic zones, uh, and this one is in uh, Taiwan, you know, there are a lot of seismic events happens over there. Uh, people who are doing performance-based design, they, they always use Tichi earthquake, okay, uh, forces from uh, Taiwan, okay. So if we have a uh, vibration control devices, in that case, uh, we need to know responses, not only in total response, we need to un uh, estimate the responses mode by mode. So we come up with uh, another uh, analysis scheme that is uh, called UMRHA, Uncoupled Model Response History Analysis. Uh, this has been used uh, for quite a long time, uh, actually introduced by A.K. Chopra. And uh, we used in this case, and then uh, we were able to uh, estimate the responses mode by mode, okay? Here, this red line again, uh, nonlinear response history analysis outcome. This green dash is the outcome of the same approach, but this is a combined response of all the modes. And then uh, we can also estimate responses for each of the modes. Okay, now if you have a vibration uh, control device and you want to suppress a particular modal response, so let's say, first mode response or maybe second mode. If you want to observe the performance of uh, your dampers, you also need to estimate modal responses. So that is why uh, this uh, uh, method has been introduced, all right? Okay, now uh, so far um, I have shown that this method performs well, but that is based on uh, nonlinear response history analysis outcomes that we, we have checked. Uh, actually, for earthquake engineering, if you if you uh, come up with any sort of a new concept, initially what you try is to compare the outcomes with nonlinear response history, uh, uh, outcomes as well, uh, because uh, that is a very good uh, way to verify what uh, uh, your proposed method, how, how good they can perform. But Again, we cannot really tell uh, that how good it will perform in real world scenario, right? So that is why uh, we have instrumented two of the buildings. One is located in Chiang Mai, another is in Chiang Rai with uh, low cost accelerometers, all right? So this, uh, this is a hospital building in Chiang Rai where we have instrumented uh, about uh, 12 accelerometers, all right? So this accelerometer A is placed in four, uh, four floor levels. This accelerometer B, that one is actually uh, placed in eight floor levels, all right? Now uh, we instrumented this uh, structure in uh, more number of floors than we require, all right? For example, these blue uh, blinking dots, these are additional uh, floors that we have instrumented. Uh, so that we can verify our proposed approach with the actual uh, acceleration uh, outcomes coming from these sensors. And then we place these accelerometers in uh, consecutive uh, uh, pairs of floors so that the story brief responses that we can estimate by, by the approach that I have shown earlier, we can compare the outcomes with uh, actual uh, sensor outcomes if, if there is any earthquake event in that case, okay? So this, so what we can verify, we can verify acceleration response, displacement, and story drift. Problem is to get the force-based response, we have to instrument a strain gauge, but uh, that is to be done uh, at the uh, construction phase of the structure. So, which is not possible because this structure is already standing. So that is why uh, we did some tests in our structure lab. So we made a model, we instrumented with uh, accelerometers and we also instrumented it with 
uh, strain gauges so that we can uh, observe the performance of uh, our force based responses like storage shear force and overturning moment responses. The um, method that we have proposed, uh, we want to validate that. Okay. So it already explained one thing that why uh, accelerometers are very much used these days because uh, if you want to use strain gauges, then okay, it, it has to be done at the very early stage of the construction of the structure. That is the reason uh, these uh, accelerometers are mostly used because it can be installed uh, after construct, uh, finishing construction uh, of a structure, okay? So that is why uh, accelerometers are getting uh, more, more popular, but we can use that information to get even uh, in-depth uh, responses, all right? Now, what we need now, uh, like uh, what, is, what is the next? Uh, it may sound a bit harsh, most likely, uh, right? Uh, currently, we are waiting for an earthquake, okay? Uh, because we, we have an uh, instrumental building in Chiang Mai as well as in Chiang Rai. So if uh, these places are actually quite uh, uh, like well known in Thailand for their seismic activities, but if there is an earthquake event, uh, we should be able to get uh, data from our instrumented uh, accelerometers, and then uh, we can use that one to verify uh, the methods that, that we have been working for for, for um, quite a few years. Uh, we have verified them with uh, nonlinear response history analysis, but we really want to get uh, the real structure response. So, well, I cannot say hopefully, but well, if there is an earthquake, that will be uh, quite quite helpful for for our uh, research study. And uh, anyway, I know it was a boring session, and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And if you want to. Uh, know into details of something, then you may uh, contact us as well. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Sia. Uh, no, it's, it's not a boring session at all. Uh, <laughs> someone like me, which has no background in engineer, I actually enjoy uh, listening to it. Uh, and to me, the thing is very interesting is uh, the last part of the presentation mentioned about the, the need of the maybe the hospital uh, to maybe uh, monitor very closely and uh, not only the health of the people, but also the health of the structures that also keeping the uh, people, the patients and visitors in that building. So I think uh, these finite things of the instrument is very important uh, to reduce uh, that impact from the risk. Uh, secondly, uh, from my part, I uh, personally impressed with the idea of these instruments and device that we, we actually you show to us that actually uh, in these days we also have technologies that even uh, less cost and be able to install these devices you know more you know uh, more numbers than before and actually the cost of that is less comparing to the life that we save uh, from that so i think it's really uh, fantastic and, and eye-opening for me um, so uh, audience I can also ask or inquire some of the information from Zia and, and Ong. Uh, you can, you know, raise your hand and then you can, you can also speak in your microphone. And we have engineer Zia and engineer Ong here uh, to entertain your questions, if any. So there are a couple of questions uh, in okay. the chat box. So uh, Zia, uh, the first question is uh, on uh, slide six, uh, how do we filter the acceleration? Could you explain? Slide number six? Yes. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, this one, right? Uh, whoever asks question, they and they talk also. Okay, okay. Uh, let's say if, if slide number six, and I, I believe this is the one. Uh, here, actually I have shown data-driven uh, analysis scheme, but I haven't gone into details of this particular method, all right? Uh, this method is called MSBE. Uh, more shape based estimation. Uh, this approach actually requires acceleration response of only two floor levels, or maybe three, okay? Uh, one is at the ground floor, uh, second floor, and top uh, roof acceleration. Then from the roof acceleration, using roof acceleration and second floor acceleration, we can get transfer ratios. And then based on the transfer ratio, if we just uh, 
filter the roof acceleration data uh, we, we, can, we can use butterworth filter okay and uh, in that case just by filtering the roof acceleration data we would be able to model uh, get the model acceleration okay now question is why i haven't shown details of this particular approach uh, when we verified, we uh, find out that performance of this approach is not so uh, accurate as the method that we actually promoted in, in this presentation later on, okay? So this is one of the approaches. That's why it has been introduced here, but this one is not the best approach, all right? Uh, actually, basic of uh, uh, this data-driven analysis scheme uh, this one is to get the model coordinate or model decomposition. This is the very basic. And you can do the model decomposition in a number of ways. Uh, one is by the solution uh, that I have shown. Then there is another approach called orthogonal filter methods. And then this one, uh, which is filtering the roof acceleration data based on the transfer ratio. And uh, the filter I have used, that one is uh, a bidirectional Butterworth filter, all right? I, I hope I answered the question, but if you want to know details, well, of course, uh, you can communicate or you, you may ask. I can I can help addressing the second question, uh, Ong. Uh, how did you calculate response for other flaws, uh, Zia? All right. I think this slide will answer. Okay. Uh, yeah, I try to go a bit slow, but uh, okay, sometimes it can be a bit uh, complicated. Okay, sometimes. All right. Uh, Actually, if we just by solution of these two equations, you can estimate the responses of non instrumental floors. Okay. What does the first step one that, that says? Uh, if we have instrumented floors like fifth floor, ninth floor, let's say we, we have instrumented 10 floors, and then we have one accelerometer in the ground floor level. Okay. So you know the ground acceleration you know the acceleration of your instrumented force just from your sensor. You have the finite element model. From there, you can get the more shape of uh, those flow levels, okay? Uh, we use normalized mode shape without even, okay? So that means only unknown in this equation is this part, which is called modal acceleration. So just by solution of this equation, what you will get is a modal acceleration. This is the process that is called modal decomposition. I have shown in the previous uh, uh, question and session that this one, you can also get it by filtering, but that one doesn't perform well, okay? And there are various uh, reasons for that. I, I even have a conference publication on that, why it is, okay? Uh, but, okay, if you want, I can explain that one later as well, okay? Now, uh, from the step one, you get the modal acceleration. In this step two, you will use the same equation. But this time, if you notice, I put U2, 3. That means these are the floors which are non-instrumented. Okay? And these are the response that we have to estimate. And for the non-instrumented floors, we have uh, more shapes. These are the more shape of the non-instrumented floors that you can get from finite element model. You can use the modal acceleration from this step one you have the ground acceleration. So every part in the right hand side is known. So just by solution of the second step, you can get uh, acceleration response of the non-instrumented floors. Okay, now if you double integrate non, uh, the acceleration response, you can get the displacement response. From there, you get the story displacement or uh, story drift, okay? so. I think I answered the question or they want to know what, how I calculated the force. Thank you, Sia. Uh, thank you. Uh, colleagues can also ask uh, supplementary questions if needed. Uh, can, uh, Sia, can we, can we detect the damage from this uh, measurement, from this device? Uh, not by the device. In fact, by the post-processing, for example, okay. Uh, let's say this structure, okay. Uh, this red line in this case, instead of nonlinear response history analysis, let's say this one is the designed uh, uh, response, let's say a uh, story share, okay? Then from this approach, uh, we can get the story uh, share response 
also from the acceleration uh, outcome. So we have acceleration outcome. From there, we get storage share response, over turning moment response, and so on. We can compare with the design consideration. So by that, yes, we can identify damage to our structure. But this is based on the global response as of now. But currently, we are working to identify responses also for the local response, like shear wall response, column response, and so on. Uh, we are working on that part. But for now, we, we can identify damage uh, by uh, checking the global response. Yes, we can. Uh, supplementary questions. Uh, can we determine the damage uh, severity, severity using this technique? Damage severity, yes. This is what I have uh, explained. Uh, for example, okay. Uh, in this case, structural damage, uh, this one is actually determined by story, uh, based on story drift response. Instead of story drift, if you just put the story share or story over turning moment response compared with the predefined threshold, yes, you can identify the severity of the damage. In fact, you can identify in better way. Better way means uh, the way that structural engineers understand better. All right. Uh, story drift response, structural engineers do understand, but uh, force based response, they, they understand better. Thank you. Uh, so next, uh, next query is about the, is there any criteria for numbers of measurements as well as selecting locations of the accelerations measurement? Okay. Uh, actually, if you go through uh, LATBSDC guideline, LATBSDC 2020, uh, you can go to page number 70, okay? Uh, in page number 70, you will find out they have given some guidelines that how many accelerometers uh, you need to instrument, but it says in terms of channels, okay? So for example, six to 10 storage, uh, actually I have it open. Can I, can I show it from there? Okay, please, please. All right, okay. Somehow I assumed. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. Uh, it says if your structure is six to 10 storied, you'll be needing minimum uh, 12 channels. 12 channels means, uh, one channel means one tri uh, uniaxial sensor. Uh, for our case, we use triaxial sensor, okay? So it means three is one for us. So it means uh, in this case, for the six to 10 story, you have to instrument in four flow levels, all right? 12 channels means four flow levels. And one channel you put is at the perimeter. Uh, let's go back to here. So as per LTBSDC guideline, uh, you need to put one accelerometer at this location maybe. All right. And then you have to put one at this perimeter. And then you have to put another one here. So one floor will be instrumented in three different locations with uniaxial sensors. Instead, you can place one uh, uh, triaxial as well. Uh, this is acceptable in the Philippines, right? But you have to put it at four floor levels for six to 10 story uh, building. And then uh, over 50 meter height, you have to put it uh, in 10 floor levels, uh, 30 means uh, 10 floors, okay? And by our, uh, the responses that we have obtained so far, uh, what we find out to get the acceleration response correct, we need to instrument a structure in uh, about 10 floor levels, all right? To get the displacement response correct, four floor levels, okay? Uh, Inter-story drift, maybe seven floors, and then to get the force-based responses, maybe nine floors is okay. If your structure is symmetric, asymmetric structure actually building to building it varies, okay? But you can identify the numbers very accurately. We can do that also uh, by the finite element uh, model. If you run the nonlinear response history analysis, you can see that, okay, we check, we put accelerometers in these flow levels, how good our uh, approach works so we can identify uh, from that for asymmetric building as well. I hope I answered that question. Uh, so next next questions. 
can we use pretension beams in high rise building then we can do pbd is this recommended confer uh, i will take this uh, question yes okay we can uh, use the pretension uh, beams uh, in the buildings uh, but we need to check the tactility uh, demand requirements uh, based on the seismicity uh, of the <coughs> of the region that uh, location that the building is uh, located and also you need to uh, check and uh, test those uh, pretension beams uh, for the hysteresis behavior nonlinear behavior how much tactility they can uh, provide so this kind of information is important uh, when you do uh, pbd using those uh, types of beams and then you can uh, use those nonlinear parameters uh, in your finite element model and you can check their performance uh, thank you uh, thank you kun kunong uh, i am now okay uh, let's uh, i miss uh, some questions uh, let's see um, uh, below the data so thank you very much how uh, how do you calculate the model chips and dumping from sensor data yes 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 sorry uh, I, I just moved myself sorry yeah uh, okay uh, from the uh, first fourier transformation you will get up uh, actually a spectral density that one you can uh, use to get the mode shapes from from the data okay so for example you get it from a uh, top floor and you get it from uh, let's say somewhere in the middle floor so just by uh, dividing the power spectral density uh, you should be able to get the more shapes so that is the mode shape and then uh, damping you get the top acceleration data and what we use is random decrement technique so if you use a random decrement technique from there you should be able to get the uh, damping ratio uh, next question sir is data driven methodologies for assessing impact of earthquake is acceptable for high rise building more than 200 height 200 meters height uh, actually height is not the limit in this case i'll say but the thing is number of uh, modal participation will will be uh, increased also okay uh, i think i have shown results which uh, um, uh, okay, data driven, I, I didn't show uh, over over 200, okay. But the thing is, uh, what we believe, height is not really the problem. The uh, number of modal participation may be higher in that case, but we can we can check it that how many mo uh, modal response participation uh, is required for uh, such a tall building. Maybe instead of 10 modes uh, for the acceleration response, let's say, uh, for a building of 120 meters, 10 modes is enough. If it gets taller, maybe number of model participation uh, might increase, okay? So, but the thing is, uh, if the method is applicable, yes, this is the same uh, method that uh, you can uh, apply for if, even taller buildings. Uh, yeah, I think I think it, 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 it should work, but okay, we'll also check that is, that is also a common, I mean, something that we, we should think Thank of. Thank you, actually. sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, next uh, one is very interesting. Uh, do we always need to have a 3D model of the buildings to have a reference of comparison from the device? Uh, okay, a 3D model of the building. Uh, in this case, the approach I have shown, uh, the mode shapes that we are getting is getting from the finite element model, okay? Not from the measurement, okay? Some people ask, uh, okay, why you are not just measuring the mode shapes from uh, instrumental sensors or maybe with the portable sensors. If you work uh, on the ambient vibration, then you'll, you'll realize that uh, we can hardly get first or second modes from the measurement. That is why we use finite element model to get higher mode shapes. And yes, that's why we need the finite element model to get the mode shapes, not by comparing the outcomes. Okay. Here I compare the outcomes because uh, this is. Uh, approach that is under development. Now we have instrumented a structure. As I say, we are actually waiting for an earthquake to verify. All right. Uh, so till now, that's that is why we are using. But the thing is, it, it is not really made to. Uh, this approach is not required uh, to be verified with finite element model. Uh, last 
uh, questions. How do you overcome the problem of the environmental noise may have in your calculation? Uh, Disturbance. Uh, okay, okay. How, how can we come up with a solution? Overcome that, overcome that, yes. There might be some disturbance. Okay. Uh, yeah, what it means is uh, how do you filter or clear those uh, okay. noises, uh, vibrations? Actually, uh, actually, if a seismic event, we are talking about here seismic event that have very high amplitude. So if, if the sensor have noise, okay, the main base sensors that have noise and uh, we cannot as of now, we cannot use it for ambient vibration measurement, all right? But that noise is actually very small when it comes to a large amplitude uh, event like earthquake. So that filtering in this case is not really uh, actually required in that case, okay? Now for the ambient vibration measurement where we use force balance accelerometers that have less of a noise, and then when it goes to the frequency domain, that noise no longer actually uh, appears in most of the cases, no longer appears in the nature period of the structure because nature periods are like low frequency, right? So normally the noise that we get that are much higher frequency. So uh, it really doesn't, uh, I mean, uh, disturb uh, the approaches that we, we are working on. I, I believe I'm clear. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 Kun Ong, do you have anything to, to add or to, uh, to conclude uh, to the audience with regard to this uh, presentation or topics? Thank you, uh, everyone, uh, for participating in this uh, talk. And uh, if you have any uh, questions about the structural health monitoring or performance based or seismic design or or wind engineering study, wind tunnel testing, you can contact us. Uh, we are happy to assist you. You can uh, send to our uh, office emails, uh, solutions at AIT.ac.th or to our uh, emails. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kun Ong. And also for the uh, video clips of this uh, uh, seminar, uh, we will post in AIT extensions, uh, uh, Facebook and YouTube. And also this link will also go to AIT Solutions. So the audience will not need to worry about that. Those who are, cannot catch up or getting some late attendance, you can still get the uh, very useful information from this, uh, from this presentation for sure. And, and last but not the least, I would like to uh, give on behalf of the audience, give a big, big thanks to uh, within the engineer who uh, gave us and also give us a very eye-opening uh, you know, presentation, information, and about the possibility of the advanced instruments that can help us, you know, and can also help the, uh, to, to can, can also monitor a better help uh, of the building. So on behalf of uh, organizer, AIT Extensions, we would like to thank AIT Solutions, engineers, and Mr. Ong and Sir Din again for giving us a chance uh, to, you know, spread these information. And as uh, Mr. Ong said, if you are interested to other information, uh, write them an email, and actually we have the a full uh, course with the certificates that anybody of you interested in the uh, performance based, you know, uh, the size of the uh, buildings and structures, uh, please feel free to let uh, AIT Solution know, and they will be happy to give you information about the program that we are giving to the engineers and young engineers to be able to uh, expand further of these technologies. So. Uh, with this, I would like to uh, uh, join with uh, Mr. Ong to conclude this and also say thank you to the audience and looking forward to see you again in our next sessions. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.